Now, would you please join me in giving a very warm New Zealand welcome to the author of Too Much and Not the Mood, Montreal-based Doga Chubos. <laughs> Durga, how are you feeling? A bit nervous. A bit nervous? A, very, a bit nervous, not too nervous, a bit nervous. Are you jet lagged? <laughs> Who knows anymore? <laughs> Who knows? I'm barely cognizant, but I'm very much available to this room today, so. Amazing. I, uh, I'm really glad that we're doing this. I feel like uh, this was just a strange sort of turn of events. Um, I knew that you were coming to speak at the Writers' Festival and I knew I would sort of be in town and hanging out with you, but uh, somebody asked me if I wanted to share this talk, and I was so happy because um, I remember you were finishing up the book in Montreal mm -hmm. uh, around the same time that I was finishing up Melodrama in New York, and we would sort of have brief moments of uh, checking in on each other or yeah. saying hello. And uh, Yeah, it was, it was so a nice. really good timing, actually. Mm, mm. Actually, I remember you sent me a song before it was even finished, maybe? Oh, I did? Yeah. Oh my, what did I send you? Do you uh, remember? <laughs> I feel like it was uh, Writer in the Dark. Oh, I don't yeah, know. maybe I sent it to you. Oh, I, yeah. And I played it, and you, I remember you being like, don't play it with your headphones or something. So I was like, okay, I have to find some room to play this in. Oh, oh, And amazing. it was like, I felt... Um, the part where you're singing like that you're your mother's daughter, I felt very connected to that. Hi, so mom. My mom was here Because <laughs> right. I was oh, hi. <laughs> still She's in edits right. on my book and there's so much in that about my relationship to my parents Absolutely. and to hear someone sort of evoke a similar mood, I kind of was like, okay, I'm on the right track. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I love that we were sort of in that time together. And I, uh, I wanted to talk actually about... Um, getting our auras read, <laughs> um, which I thought would be a nice sort of uh, way to express sort of that time that we spent together. So you um, talk in the book about going to a place in Chinatown in New York called Magic mm -hmm. Jewelry um, mm -hmm. to get your aura read with another friend of ours, um, but that's something that I did with you as well. Do you want to explain yeah, about that? Yeah, it's this very kind of... Uh, I, it's not scientific in the least, no, <laughs> which no. I need to clarify. Um, it's this uh, kind of crystal stone jewelry place in Chinatown in Manhattan and um, you get your aura photographed um, and it develops into essentially some kind of like rainbowed print. Yeah, you sort of get a Polaroid yeah. of yourself with this um, halo of color around it and this very nice young man um, is my I know. making a sort of... I think it's mine. A, is it mine? About, I think it's me because I gesticulate too wildly. This I'll might just be stay my very earrings. still. Should I take my earrings off? No, they look so nice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and this very uh, nice young man sort of explains to you where you are at in your life and, uh, you know, what's is going on emotionally. I mean, it's hard to know. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's probably mine. <laughs> Sorry. And... Uh, and you, yeah, you, I mean, you're right. It's not scientific, but it can be such a uh, sign when you need it. You know, he, I remember uh, mm -hmm. we went together and he would tired shame us. He would be like, you are just so tired. I can feel it. And we'd be like, yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, if, you, if, you're, if your photograph like develops and your, um, your face or profile is really defined, for some reason that means you're exhausted. Yes. And so the three of us, he was just like looking at us very concerned as our parents might, you know, with my bags under my eyes constantly just being like, you need to sleep was essentially yes. what we heard. Yes, <laughs> but um, I thought it was interesting in the book, um, you talk about how yours were often uh, shades of purple or violet mm -hmm. in that time. And I, uh, I, I, the bottom third of the book is this purple and I, wondered if uh, this colour had been a house for you at that time. For me, I find um, I will sort of be drawn to a colour and it will be this house that I live within for a season or two and it will sort of define everything that I make and then the colour will shift. Was that the case yes, with this? Sure. It was. I was seeing purple everywhere. Mm -hmm. I think it was also a return because so much of my book takes place in my childhood, mm -hmm. and I remember as a, as a child, purple being sort of very defining for me, like the sweatshirt I always wore until it smelled bad, mm -hmm. you know? Those leggings that were torn. Um, it's very like mark of the late 80s, early 90s too, mm -hmm. I think, and so I think part of the book for me was a return to that time and purple felt 
really natural to me, and I also think I felt very calmed by it. Um, I'm really sensitive to colors mm. and light, and mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing offensive <laughs> to me about it or too bright, and I wanted to wrap myself around it. But yeah, it's funny, once you decide a color is your home, as you mm -hmm. put it, you see it everywhere. Yes, yep. And when I was working on the book, it was everywhere, and then it's that thing, it's like if you tell your friends that, you're into frogs. When they travel, they bring you back frog knickknacks. Yeah. <laughs> and then suddenly you're like, I didn't ask for this. And mm -hmm. you have all this like frog crap with me. Mm -hmm. It was like purple. Like everyone was just like, I saw this and I thought of you and you should have this because it's purple. Yes. <laughs> oh, um, that's spoken about in uh, Blue It's by Maggie yes, Nelson, yes, right? Exactly. She says everyone is just bringing her all of this blue from the exactly. world, which is yeah. so beautiful. Yeah. Um, it's funny. Purple was a big color for me in that same season. And uh, it was definitely something that I wanted to sort of put into the album cover and sort of have around me all the time and then it moved into a lilac. It's like interesting how it moves. Mm -hmm. But uh, do you have a colour right now? What are you living underneath? I know you wrote, Durga wrote this beautiful um, piece about a colour called Sporty Pink. <laughs> um, and I wasn't sure if that was just like a colour you were picking up on culturally or if that was your personal colour. I think right it now. was, I wrote that piece actually recently because again, I was thinking a lot about my past and I was thinking about how our generation is so almost involved with these like pastels and desaturated colors mm -hmm. that I don't particularly connect with that often. This totally. sort of like austerity that I don't necessarily know is earned <laughs> in some <laughs> ways. And it's funny how a pastel is sort of austere. Yeah. Huh? It's very limiting. It's Ve like yeah, and very little. manicured, right? <laughs> yeah. And so I wanted to write a piece that kind of celebrated sort of the brash colors we grew up with when we were still scraping our knees and being a little less moved by seriousness, sure. sort of. Um, but no, I don't think there's anything particular right now. If I had a bigger project I was working on, there probably would be, because like you said, you sort of need those variables set in place that kind of create whatever zone you're gonna be working in. And right now I'm just doing a bunch of small things, so I'm not like concentrated in that mm -hmm. way. Part of me thinks when you start um, seeing that color again everywhere, it means that something is on the way and mm -hmm. you're about to sort of go into that world again. Um, cool, I love that. Um, should we pour some water? Sure. Is that okay? Yeah, all five glasses. Yeah, I'll do them all. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that thing they do with champagne where they just go over all the glasses. <laughs> okay. Um, there you go. So I wanted to um, talk to you about the first essay in the book, Heart Museum. Um, it's one I can almost never get through in one sitting. It is sort of this big, bright crash course in Durga. It's like <laughs> this... It's miraculous. It's it's all of these moments and memories and images and sounds, and you zoom in and out really really fast and sort of. Uh, it's it's amazing to me. It actually reminded me of um, a Tobias Wolf story called Bullet in the Brain. Oh yeah. Which is uh, oh, yeah. is uh, a story about um, a man who gets shot in a bank robbery, and it sort of describes all of the th moments that leave him as the bullet um, travels. <laughs> um, yeah, I love that story. Yeah, yeah. It's got a similar, like you said, zoom in, zoom out. Totally. Yeah. Um, but I think of these gatherings of sensory cues in your work as bouquets. They're sort of these like sumptuous, perfumed moments of language. You know, you talk about um, a family wedding dress being made of parachute silk or the crook of an elbow or... Um, you know, the shoulders and basic instinct being the sexy part. Like, oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, all of these little details. And uh, it's not a sparingly used device in your work, which I really like. Um, so I guess I just wanted to, yeah, or in this essay, this is definitely kind of full of those sorts of beautiful references. Um, yeah, so I guess I just wanted to uh, hear a little bit about your choice of starting the book with Heart Museum and um, sort of your use of those sensory cues. Yeah, I definitely, um, I used this book as an opportunity to sort of take advantage of all the ways when I'm writing a single essay for like a publication that I'm given a lot of parameters, if it's anything from word count or subject matter or I'm very irritating for a lot of my editors because they like have to rein in all my tangents. Like I always feel like <laughs> I give them a draft and they're there like lassoing yeah, yeah. me like, you know, in the right direction because I tend to just speed off into 
the opposite direction. I, Which I and love. I inevitably return, but you know, when you have like a 500 word piece, it's- I'm gonna take my earrings off. I think this is the problem. Okay. 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 We're good. It might Sorry. be mine. No, it's good. Okay. It's um, so I really use this as a, a, like I sort of, it was one of the few times in my life where I really felt I was taking advantage of an opportunity fully. Um, initially that essay was supposed to be a page. Mm. I had a whole section in my book proposal where I wanted to challenge myself to have um, sort of like Lydia Davis inspired one page essays uh -huh. on, on specific topics. And this one is still saved in my computer in my original like files under the one page essay wow. folder, but wow. it turned out to be 93 pages yes. or whatever. So <laughs> well over a third it, of yeah, the book. So I really yeah, exactly. Mm. So I really took advantage of that. Mm. Um, and I think part of it too was that for me, I'm not a particularly rebellious person. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like someone was giving me an opportunity, my publisher and my editor to really be me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I thought, okay, let me see how, what they, let's see if this is really what they mean, you know? Right. And um, yeah, it was a really good exercise actually and like kind of also being judicious about my tangents but <laughs> also honoring that there's something in there that's building part of something bigger and it's like worth it to needle away at that stuff and figure out, okay, is this something I really want, I've been wanting to talk about and I haven't found a home for it and mm -hmm. this might be the place. Um, but yeah, that essay kind of took on a life of its own. And sometimes when I'm reading from it, the strangest thing happens where I don't even remember writing certain parts of it. Wow. So something kind of took over, I think. Mm -hmm. And whatever that is, I hope it comes back at some point. Yeah. Because it really does feel magical. Um, and I sometimes feel very lucky that that happened, too. Absolutely. Like, I love that I was able to have an unconscious act happen while I was writing. I... I'm, I feel like it's the perfect um, first essay for your first book because in a lot of ways it feels like um, you're sort of laying the terms for what you are like going to make in perpetuity. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but even the idea of a heart museum, you know, I feel like I read that and I was like, oh, that's like my life. That's what I'm trying to build as a heart museum, you know. Um. I originally actually wanted to put it at the end of the book and my editor was sort of like, you cannot do that to yeah. a reader. Oh, yeah. It's no. so inconsiderate. Yeah. They read the whole book and then suddenly they're faced with nearly 100 pages. Yeah. Um, but actually, one of my other editors was the one who recommended that we put it first and her reasoning was um, related to a, an author whose work I really love and it's Hilton Alls and mm. it, in White Girls, which is a collection of his essays, a lot of it is criticism. The first essay, Tris Tropique, is the most autobiographical one and mm -hmm. it's the longest one. And like you said, it sort of like sets the tone. Yep. It gets everyone in the room to like be breathing the same at the same beat, sort of. Mm -hmm. So it sort of it's a good way to kind of get everyone in your world uh -huh. almost. Absolutely. Oh, man, I love it so much. It's uh yeah, I've really tried to read all ninety three pages in one sitting before and it is uh it is too, it's, it, it's, it's too much in the most beautiful way. It's, uh, I just feel flooded by Durga, which is so <laughs> lovely. Um, I was interested in, uh, when he was reading this essay in particular, he sort of thought about, um, I guess the sort of, you know, the sentimentality of including these details of uh, the sort of sensitive parts of people's bodies and a color in the corner of a painting that you that makes you realize, oh, I haven't seen all the colors in the world, you know, the inside of a fruit. And I, um, there's something to me which is feminine about that detail. And I know in my work, um, I, I, I'm very sensory and very detail oriented also, but it sort of is something that I maybe shy away from at times because I think, I think I'm at risk of over feminizing my work, but mm -hmm. it never seems like a concern with, with your work at all, I never, I never feel that. Maybe that's just my own glitch that I have, but I'm curious. No, it's definitely uh, something that I've been insecure about. Um, I, I never- Oh, don't be, it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like interested no, in how- Well, it's, but it's, it is a kind of, there's an environment. I know when I first started writing in the first person or more personal essays, um, I had a lot of insecurity over the fact that it felt like there was a climate for 
uh, nonfiction where unless you were arguing an idea, there was really no room for you. And I've always felt sort of insecure about what are my ideas and do I have much argumentative rhetoric in me naturally? And I don't necessarily. Um, and so there, I've always been a bit nervous if maybe I'm too indulgent or words that get thrown a lot thrown around a lot, especially with women writers, is maybe she's too precious, you know? Maybe she doesn't know oh. how to edit out, you know? Oh, no. Um, well, it feels <laughs> meticulous. It, it, it never feels like it needs an edit. Um, it just, it's, it's very brave um, going into that much uh, detail and, and, and harnessing that sentimentality. I think it's really beautiful. Mining, mining something without feeling like, um, you know, Mining, mining something that I'm not sure necessarily has a huge point is a real challenge for me that I love. Mm. Um, if I'm writing a film review, for instance, I really, the part that really makes me feel insecure as a film critic yeah. is in the second paragraph, usually your editor requires that you know summarize the film. And right. I avoid it at all costs. <laughs> right. And I know I'm gonna get the note. Sometimes I just like send the draft in with like a big TK like to come. I promise I'll get to the plot, don't worry. <laughs> and then I just phone in at the last minute because mm -hmm. plot just doesn't interest me that much. Right now it doesn't, right? Mm. And so that kind of, um, that kind of writing, it's more that it actually also bores me a little and mm -hmm if I'm feeling a little bit bored or uninspired, I'm just not gonna mine those corners of a painting or the stuff that really turns me on and makes me wanna make art. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it also has to do with, again, with this project, I was given the opportunity to really tell my own story and I didn't wanna waste that by having all the voices in my head that come from exterior forces saying, this is what an essay is, mm. this is what an argument is, this is how you conclude. I wanted to sort of really honor that there's another way to do it, and mm -hmm. I've, I've felt that, and I've known it, and now someone's granted me sort of the opportunity, mm. and I, I didn't want to waste it. So mm. I think that was part of it, too. I, uh, it's pretty sweet that you keep saying somebody has granted you the opportunity, <laughs> but you did that to yourself. I need you to, like, I hope you know that this is all yeah, you. Yeah, I still, I um, guess, in my head that I needed, you know, a whole, uh, sort of a whole sure. team to get me in the right yeah. place. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's true. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, uh, and I think uh, the way, the ways in which you communicate plot, which are often uh, these little vignettes, and the one that sticks out to me is uh, you're getting ready for a friend's sort of party and she's moved house and you don't know her address and your partner at the time just says the address in this way that makes you think, huh? And it's just this tiny moment and yeah. you sort of, you say in the book that it, it your intuition was there, but uh, it's sort of all that you need, you know, to yeah. communicate this whole time in your life, this whole you know, that whole year-long end of a relationship or whatever, you know, and I, I really respect that kind of narrative. Having intuition <clears throat> as a writer is, like, the greatest gift, but mm -hmm. as a person in the world, it can make you oh, very hell. paranoid and <laughs> yeah. jealous and also feel almost um, in trouble for knowing before you can utter, you know, having a feeling um, without proof and the world requires proof so much, can make you feel insecure or that you are functioning at like a different plane. Absolutely, I have that too. And I think, um, I always have this thing where I feel like I'll say the thing that I'm thinking and everyone's like, you're insane. And you give it like six months to a year and that thing comes true. But it's like, I feel like my life is just these periods of limbo when nobody believes me. <laughs> yeah, and no one loves, no one likes an I told you so, so then you no, just kind no, of you have to... No, no, you can never I told you yeah, so, Yeah, you can never I strange... told you so. And also using words like uh, feeling like you might have a psychic element to you or something can really turn people off. But mm -hmm. what I've come to understand it as is I just think that there are certain people who are paying such close attention and um, with that you can build a sense of like prophetic knowing when mm -hmm. really it's just you're paying attention and things happen in cycles and patterns and so you just kind of are born knowing what might happen mm -hmm. but it's not you know so magical it's just you're paying attention yeah I believe that that uh and I, I I remember you saying something to me about walking into a restaurant with somebody and knowing uh immediately that 
it's you're not going to be able the light is not you can't make this work <laughs> yeah <laughs> but, bad lighting you know, can really ruin yeah everything. but that's <laughs> almost it's the same uh sort of train of thought I'm I'm the same I'm uh yeah it's this overlying sensitivity that uh sort of makes the world very accessible to yeah. you all the time yeah um, and, and you become for incredibly for worse. sensitive right <laughs> yes yeah. yes absolutely yeah. um I wanted to um, talk about growing up in Montreal. Mm -hmm. You were born and raised mm -hmm. in Montreal. Yes. Um, Durga speaks French, which I think is very impressive. <laughs> um, and we sort of, we went for this um, walk the other day and mm -hmm. we were talking about sort of both being from somewhere which is not necessarily the place mm -hmm. um, and how you know, Durga has lived in New York for 10 years. Yeah. Um, I've sort of spent a little bit of time there, but um, we both understand the feeling of being in the city that belongs to everyone and having, you know, these close relationships with people that feel different to the ones that happen when you are at home, sort of in that specific environment. And I guess mm -hmm. I wanted to um, hear a little bit from you about that feeling, whether you think um, being from Montreal maybe informs your work at all, um, and just about life there and what it does for you as a creative. Yeah, I definitely, one of the reasons why I moved back to Montreal um, was because I felt like I wanted to return to whatever original part of me um, hadn't yet been kind of, uh, affected by America or affected by certain like tiers of privilege that I hadn't really encountered until I'd gone to college in the US. Um, but also a lot of it was that I personally feel like what happens when you have a lot of artists in a city like New York is people stop telling the stories that are their weird, strange like beginnings. Mm -hmm. um, you kind of like recycle certain interests and Part and of me, curate much it, more. Yeah, sort you of curate, exactly. Sure. You, you end up thinking about more what people will think of you than what you do at home alone that's weird and that's what you should actually be writing about, mm -hmm. right? And part of that too is that, you know, growing up in Montreal, I was on student council and was an athlete and all these things that seem so plain, but in You're that... You're an athlete? What did you do? <laughs> soccer, but I'm soccer? not good. Oh my <laughs> Football, gosh. Football, I don't know. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I, well, it was, it, was the, it was that part of me, though, where so much of that's in the book. Like, you learn about your body, about other friends' mothers on mm -hmm. the field. You learn about so many structures that could seem really plain, but when you write about it, that's how you perceive the world, you mm. know? Um, I kind of, most of my book skips actually my 20s. A lot of it goes straight into my childhood and uh, my parents. And so that was for me really formative, even though I didn't know then I wanted to be a writer. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I was like every kid who was sort of creative but bad at math. So you thought, okay, I'll be like an architect. You know, <laughs> sure. like I think that was sort of like the option, right? Yes. And, but I wanted to return to that time mm. because. Um, even, you know, meeting your friends here, like, I love that, I love a sort of insular environment that feels far away from the fray in some mm -hmm. ways, because there's a, a comfortableness and a naturalness and people's pursuits, I almost trust them more. Mm -hmm. And I, I really miss that. And I, I do feel like living in New York informed a lot of my writing voice and who I read and, um, who I let into my life, mm -hmm. but I also really, really value the proximity to being around family and um, cousins. Mm. You know, like this, that's a, such a strange relationship, a cousin. Sure. You know, like you're and doesn't really fit into somewhere like New York City. Exactly. Like. Yeah, I don't know anybody's cousins in New York, yes. but I go I go home to Montreal and I'm like meeting cousins, children, mm. and. Um, that sort of relational stuff is really integral to my writing. Mm -hmm. I love how you can inherit a parent's gestures, not just, you know, their looks. Mm -hmm. I love that, you know, what you grew up eating, you'll eventually crave when you're sick and need mm. to learn how to cook. Like, for me, that's a form of writing. It's Absolutely. like writing is, like, always about a return. So, yeah, I, I, I do really feel lucky that I grew up in a city that is so peculiar in its way and um, 
it feels like a city that's a work in progress. Mm -hmm. Whereas I feel like leaving New York wasn't as tragic as some might think because it always feels the same. Sure. It's relentless. Yes. You know? And you come back and uh, you're like, oh, they didn't miss me here. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing, which is all kind of heartbreaking. Montreal <laughs> to me feels, I don't know if you relate to this um, when you come home, but Montreal to me feels like tonally what a residency should feel like, which is that you get... Explain that. <laughs> well, it's like you don't, you're not, you don't wake up and then have to join the rhythm of a city that's already started. You can choose how to deliberate on your day. And regardless if you have a job or commitments that you have to get to at whatever hour, mm -hmm. it still feels completely intentional. Right. Interesting. And I just didn't always feel that way in New York. Mm. I, I started to only know one reality and then I joined that reality and then it was hard to kind of float up from it, you mm. know? And in Montreal, I have this sense of the weekend or 4 p.m. on a Tuesday, you know? I it's, believe it's, that too. It, it's just really different. And mm -hmm. one thing I always use as an example is I only developed an adult relationship with my parents through Christmas vacations because I was living away, mm -hmm. right? And now I can go with my father to run errands. And I love that. Mm. You know, he's like always at the bank. I don't know what he's doing there. <laughs> he's always going to the bank. And actually one day, actually before coming here, I was thinking, oh, I should get some currency. And I called him because I knew this would thrill him. And I was like, do you want to go to the bank? He's like, always. <laughs> So, oh, this is where you got your currency yeah. that I won't let you spend. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, get away from yeah, me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so I just feel sort of like that stuff is Absolutely. so storied for me. And I, I mean, I write about it in my book because even just thinking about the bank, like these tellers, these women mm. growing up were for me like a, a sort of um, model of womanhood too. Like it's <laughs> right. funny when you're a kid, you like associate a, a certain- A fine gold chain. Yeah, a very put chain. together. There's a certain like caliber of women if they were stewardesses on a plane or tellers at the bank, there sure. was like a, an elegance that I just didn't associate maybe to the women in my family. It was like right. a different type of beauty, but you kind of put them on these pedestals and they had these jobs. And I feel like I'm returning now and kind of demystifying a lot of that, uh -huh. but still really enjoying that my imagination was not one of like, I'm going to write books that take place in far off lands. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. I was like intrigued by the bank teller mm. and that's still kind of how I am yeah. <laughs> now. So Montreal is definitely a huge part of that mm. for me. <laughs> yeah, it's so nice to um, feel luxury in those sort of small moments of home life. Yep. Um, and I think... I definitely, I sense that in the book. You know, you, all of these small uh, vignettes are treated as luxuries and maybe that um, is because you went home to finish the book and I wonder if you had been in New York, you would have treated them so sort of reverently, you know, or if they would have been quicker or, you know, more um, economical, you know? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think being, I think... I mean, something as simple as when I was finishing the book, I don't know what it's like for you in the studio when you're getting right until the end, but you kind of hit this moment of delirium, right? Because you've committed to a project and you know it have to, has to end, mm -hmm. but you also don't want it to end, mm. right? So you kind but of... But you want it to end more than anything but in the yeah, world. <laughs> yes, exactly, <laughs> right? Yeah. You, and so to live in that tension is physically so strange. Mm. And my parents would drive over to my apartment with Tupperwares of food because they knew I wasn't cooking. Oh. And yeah, I, I don't know. There's something about you know them texting me. I'm trying to finish a book being like, hey, can you return the Tupperware? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's so, it reminds you like, okay, like no matter how much you think you're finishing your first book, totally. and it's like the whole world revolves around you. <laughs> they need, they need Tupperware those back. recycled yogurt containers yes, back. Yeah, like yeah. this isn't even like new Tupperware. <laughs> totally. This is like recycled yogurt containers. So, you know, like <laughs> that is like, it's, it's legitimizing in some ways too, because it's like, you have to remember where you come from. That's that's mm. really important to me. Mm. Um, I, I, feel, I feel strange about adult friendships I have where I don't know about my friend's family. Mm -hmm. Even, and it could be bad or good, but mm. just if there's this complete cutoff and right. someone has like Gatsby restarted their lives and yes. it's really anonymous, yeah. I'm, I find it suspicious, you right, know, yes. just a little bit. I, I, <laughs> I know what you mean. So, I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that is a fascinating moment when you're... Uh, 
just sort of, it's so, you're so alone when you're finishing something and you're in that period where there's gonna be a thing. Like it's, it's all laid out, you just need to kind of put the final bits in place. There's no mystery exactly about what you're doing. It's like probably the closest thing in our lives to like getting up and going to the office and like plugging it in and going home. You know, I really felt that routine at that time. And I, um, yeah, we were in hotels a lot, but my mum's way of uh, like taking care of me in that time would be going to Strand Books and <laughs> she'd be like, here's a book about Agnes Martin. I'd be like, oh, thank you. <laughs> Lovely, like. Uh, These little tokens of inspiration very calm, to keep And they're always going, like yeah. a very calm, like, you're so nice to just like look at some Agnes Martin when you're like, so stressed out, you think you're gonna die, you know, it's uh, Tupperware adjacent, <laughs> I, I think. That's actually funny that you bring up Agnes Martin because I remember something that we, I think we were texting each other around the same time was, Agnes Martin's work is, it seems so austere, you know? Like yeah. it seems so plain mm -hmm. to anyone just like maybe walking by really quickly or flipping through her work in a book. Um, but one of her pieces, which is, I think maybe the color of this table with like li just lines, is like Couple it's, of lines. it's really the least colorful of all of hers. It's called Fiesta, <laughs> and I remember texting you maybe that, being like, "This Fiesta. is everything that I love." Yes, <laughs> it's like a title that kind of makes no sense, I but love makes Fiesta. you pause and think, and like the the, the that sort of strange pairing is exactly that sweet spot that I love. That Absolutely. That thing is called Fiesta is just brilliant to me. Yeah, so I remember we were, did you, where did you, did you see that show in New York? Yeah, at the Guggenheim, yeah. Right, so I saw it at um, LACMA and I, that was like one of the most moving uh, shows that I've been to in a long time. It was that big retrospective of her work mm -hmm. and it was, um, I really like the retrospectives at LACMA. They, I went to a Larry Sultan one there. I don't know if you're familiar with Larry Sultan. He's a photographer um, from California, but um, I bought the book from the show and the book was laid out exactly like the rooms, like the chronological order oh, that you like walk through the rooms, which is such a beautiful book to have because you really remember that it, kind of physical experience. But I remember with the Agnes Martin show, I uh, I have this like, sensory memory of there being like lots of windows open and natural light and like curtains. Obviously it's LACMA. There weren't a bunch of like curtains <laughs> there blowing were no or curtains, anything. Yeah. There's no curtains, but, uh, <laughs> but it felt so, uh, it felt like we were outdoors oh, okay, and, uh, yeah. and you know, you, you see these works and I highly recommend uh, you checking out Agnes Martin's work. If you aren't familiar with it, it is um, so beautiful, but it, it really is these sort of collections of lines and it's very simple, but they are so moving, and for me, I found, I, I walked into, there's a lot of sort of like gray and brown and um, sort of pencil colors and things, and then I turned a corner, and there was pink, and it was such a revelation. I was like, ah, oh, and just the gift of being denied that color <laughs> previously yeah. in the exhibit, and then, you know, being gifted it um, in such a revelatory way. Um, I remember thinking about that when I was, when I was reading this recently, I was like, ah, that can be a revelation sometimes, something like that. Totally. You know? and, I, and an uh, artist like her, she's such a, she's such a stalwart. And like I, her advice to other artists, there's something about her that some artists, visual artists, feel naturally very literary mm -hmm, to me. Mm -hmm. And she's one of them. Absolutely. And so much of my writing process is like not writing and just looking. Mm. And hopefully it'll end up on my screen, you sure. know? And she's someone who really inspires that in me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's amazing. Um, hmm, what do I want to ask you, Durga? <laughs> I do, I mean, I always want to, uh, I always, I'm always interested about um, sort of visual stuff, especially, you know, you are such a visual person. You're so visual, I'm almost surprised that you ended up writing, <laughs> except that you're so good at it, you know, <laughs> obviously makes sense but uh, there's really nothing else I can do so. <laughs> <laughs> but I've never met I don't think I've ever met um a writer or many people as visual as you are and you have such an extensive knowledge of film um we were talking about Polly Platt last night who oh, is yeah. a production designer that mm -hmm. Durga is really inspired by and that uh it really made me realize like oh I'm sure a lot of writers, like, you know, obviously I'm interested in, like, what you were reading at the time or what you're reading right now and or what, you know, 
informs your work or whatever, but I realised when you were talking about Polly Platt, it's probably like production designers and photographers and stuff, yeah, right? it totally um, is. It's is that a lame the question, the influences no. question? I'm just so curious because no. your style is so specific. Structured in that way, it's a very great question <laughs> yeah. because it isn't what writers inspire me. It's... I, Polly Platt is uh, the woman whom um, I quote at the beginning of my book. Um, she was a production designer and she's, I don't know, I mean, she's one of my heroes. I feel weird saying no, the word hero. Great. She's we were one in of a, my heroes. in a restaurant last night. It yeah. was very loud. And yeah, she's, she's, <laughs> she's definitely someone who um, has inspired my writing despite not being a writer. And a huge part of it is that she... Her job, you know, um, is basic. Was you know, production designing these movies, but having kind of the most elaborate instinct to turn off a light on like a, um, a gas station sign to show that this Texas town is like down and out. You mm -hmm. know, like these like little touches that become uh, like film iconography. Um, and I really admire people like that. Whenever I'm interviewing like a director or something, the question I always ask is like, how do you communicate your instincts to a team? And then how do you make them believe you without it being some like guru cult version of mm -hmm. it? You know, like how do you get people to trust that you are up to something? Mm. I've always really admired people who can do it. And Polly Platt was definitely one of them. And the quote that um, opens my book by her is, she production designed The Witches of Eastwick and she just had a vision of Jack Nicholson with a pink balloon. And wow. if anyone's seen that movie, there's this incredible scene with balloons. And I love that a little seed can then become this, like, this image that changes people's lives, mm. you know? Um, so, yeah, she's definitely someone whose work I return to, especially when I'm feeling very frustrated, mm. but I know there's something there. I remember that that's part of being an artist. That's, that's actually the work, that's the project, is no one else is gonna have that instinct. And if you can't make it happen, then what's, honestly, what's the point, mm. you know? So if, if it's by getting so good at it that you become unimpeachable, or <laughs> if it's about finding a way to carve out a space for yourself to make that work happen, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's definitely people like Polly Platt. And I love, I love the behind the scenes people, film is so different than writing because it's so inherently collaborative, right? Mm. And it takes so many people to make a single moving image, right? It horrifies me to think of um, <laughs> how many people your vision has to like funnel through. Exactly. Isn't that terrifying? It, Thank mean, God we just get to like... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just... I mean, even working on my cover, I felt like I had to involve other people and that was sort of stressful. like nightmarish to communicate exactly what I wanted, but also respecting that other people have their expertise mm. and that you should trust those as well. Like that sort of tug is, uh, is tricky for me. Uh -huh. um, so I really admire cinematographers or, you know, cinematographers, for example, they have a sort of sixth sense for light. Sure. And they have to communicate that on screen, but they also have to communicate it to everyone around them that they're, they're up to something. And that kind of skill that's, that's, so, um, that's so strong, but in a way humble, because mm. it's not like the director or something or the star, mm. I love that balance in a, in a creative person. I love, uh -huh. I love editors in, in film and, and in writing that like, behind the scenes touch mm. that, that is so strong. I, I really admire that. Mm. Yeah, I, uh, I actually saw something that um, Tavi, our mutual friend Tavi Givenson, um, posted today about uh, the Virgin Suicides, and it was a quote from Sofia Coppola, and she said that her father had said to her, um, make sure you know what the essence of this thing that you are making is to the point where you can distill it down to one word because you were going to be asked all of these questions like what sweater are they going to wear and like why should it be at this time of day and if you know that everything will become instinct and so her um she was making the virgin suicides at the time and her word was loss and it's so beautiful to think of her being like okay this top lost like yeah. of it channeling but it's so true like you just need that one word um that's really great advice <laughs> yeah you thought so that's um, great advice. Th when you were talking about Polly Platt and that I, um, it made me think of Gregory Crudson, who you um, mentioned in the book as well, and it seems like he had that 
similar, um, you know, he's uh, an American photographer and he will sort of construct these big kind of real life scenes, mm -hmm. but that are incredibly constructed and he will, you know, I mean, he'll, you see him walk like 200 yards and just dim a light slightly, mm -hmm. you know, it's, or, the, or make sure that this woman in this diner far off in the corner knows exactly what she's thinking, you know, which yeah. I think is such a gorgeous He's really cinematic and he, what he does that I think is great is he creates the reel that looks artificial, mm. which is really attractive to me. Totally. And what you were just saying about um, like a, Gregory Crutzen's photography, how he'll have like a house with like just one light on and it's like the kitchen light, which is always somehow sinister. I don't know why. <laughs> like the kitchen light on at night, it's, there's something dark about it. But I was, I was rereading this, um, this book of mine that I brought with me on this trip. Um, and it's a, it's a philosophy book, but um, it's called The Poetics of Space. And the writer quotes um, this moment that I can't believe I'm going to be talking about like real gay here, but anyways. Like, oh my gosh, this, I love it. It goes this moment of three friends walking in a field and they see a house far away in the night and a light is on. Mm -hmm. And even, if, even though this writer is with two other people, each person in that moment seeing that light in that house, they suddenly feel tremendously alone. Wow. And that's what I love about experiencing art. You know, you'll be in a museum around so many people and something about a color and a painting will suddenly make you feel completely alone. Mm. And, um, or you'll be at the movie. I mean, the movies is a perfect example. You're there in a packed room and you're connecting with a huge screen and you can feel completely alone. And I, and I mean alone in the best way. Like mm -hmm. you are a person on your path and you're connecting with something in a room full of other people. Mm. And Crutzen's photography does that to me too. It's like that really fine level of spookiness that mm. I really relate to. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love that. Um, what did you bring here to read, by the way? It, I'm curious, to, like, what people <laughs> pack for this side of the world, because it's so... <laughs> you must sort of feel like you're, like, in space right now, right? It's strange. I've adapted quite it's well. Very um, She's adapted yeah. amazingly. <laughs> yeah. I'm so impressed. I don't know. I... <laughs> The only times I feel like I'm very far from what I know is obviously the time difference thing. Mm -hmm. In fact, the strangest... It's yesterday thing, over there, which is It's yesterday, always but we're behind because we slept through an entire day of things, you know? So I woke <laughs> up this morning and I was texting someone and it was that strange feeling where you're in the future, whatever that means, but <laughs> you slept through crazy things happening in the world, so mm. you're behind. I've never felt ahead and behind at the same time. Mm. <laughs> so I'm like playing catch up, but I feel like lazy because I'm playing catch up because I just slept through it all. Mm. So I don't, it's like, is it even worth being in the future if you're missing out? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, on it's this very, very practical level, like we get, everything comes out, like all the albums come out first here. Oh, So it's okay, like yeah. this, you really do feel like you're right on the edge of this like great thing. Um, I was actually gonna ask you that <laughs> about dates, right? Talk so, to me. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so some things, this is gonna make me sound Hi. really silly no, in a room it. full of a lot of witnesses. Bring it in, bring it in. But if something happens on a date somewhere else but you're experiencing it the next day, yeah. which date are you experiencing it on here? Well, <laughs> Does that make sense to everybody? No. Yes. Maybe people will tell you at the um, because, author's okay, table. Because, okay, a good example, because <laughs> it seems to have consumed a lot of people's interests, is this royal wedding, right? Oh, So yeah. that's happening on today. Yeah, well, yes, the day before. But what date, what date, what date do you commemorate? Okay, you commemorate it on the day well, it's happening. Well, you would say see, the date, I don't want to work I this guess. out in front of so many people. Yeah, this, this is, is I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. But see, this is what I mean. Like, you're ahead. This is what happens when two friends, yeah, like, do this. this is I was scared people... that we would start talking about, like, boyfriends. You know, I just was like, no, oh, this we've is got this. No, probably very interesting like, to, to everybody. No, yeah, yeah, keep it professional. Okay, no. we can move away from the time conversation. Okay, okay. Um, sorry. No, it is confusing, and it is kind of... It is like space. I actually, um, I, I really want to visit Antarctica. Because um, to me, you know, living down here, you really are right on the edge. But that is that other step. I think that's as close as you can get to being in space on Earth. Um, oh, and wow, I think yeah. that will be like really uh, creatively sort of cleansing or settling or, you know, will kind of show me something in some way. Do you um, feel 
when you're making, when you're working on whatever project it is you're working on, do you find you benefit from isolation more or benefit from kind of regularly convening with the world or having a few people that are your orbit that kind of make you recirculate the air and share the ideas that are important to you? That's a good question. I think, um, I mean, I don't know if I do necessarily benefit from isolation. I think my ideal way of working is being in a city where I have five friends and work, mm -hmm. and so like what, two are gonna be available at any given time, maybe one if your hours are like four till, I don't know, midnight, like mine are, so um, I like that feeling of being around but being incredibly isolated and knowing mm -hmm. there really are only like two people that I could call right now, you know, that's the kind of uh, isolation I'm into. Yeah, I, uh, so around the time we were going to get our auras read, I was living, uh, in Midtown in New York, which is, we've talked about, like a bizarre place to choose. It's like no one chooses to spend any amount of time in Midtown, but I, um, it, it did have that quite isolated feeling, even though you're sort of in the throngs, like uh, no, one I, no one I knew was there. And in that way, you almost don't see any faces at all. You know, yeah. you just have your, I would walk to the train and, from the train to the studio and it would all be on this little loop. I think a, I think having a, a little loop is really important mm. for when you're making something. If you just have this small yep. uh, track that you sort of follow every day, I find that, um, I find the, the, the isolation of that very helpful. Yeah, actually, I, one thing that I remember uh, texting you when I was finishing my book was the strangest thing happens when you're really consumed by whatever project you're working on, if it's like a book or an album where you become so um, under the influence of it, but when it's winding down, I remember texting you feel, and I was like feeling kind of sad because I was riding the, the subway in New York when I was like back in New York for a second, I think, to meet with my editors, and you feel that, you almost feel like you're becoming invisible. Mm. And I just wanted to shake a stranger on the subway and be like, I'm here, I exist, because yes. can you see me? Because yes. I know I'm so real right now, but mm -hmm. I've been so involved in this thing that I haven't been sharing with anyone. And the process of working on something that only maybe five or so people have looked at, mm -hmm. but has been your whole world mm -hmm. for a certain, like for a couple of years, you start to feel like you're becoming invisible. Yes, you know? I, I actually remember writing that and the thing I wrote when I turned 20, I was sitting on the subway and I remember writing, can you see me? <laughs> like, because it really is that feeling. Yeah, you, and it, it, it's, it's sad because you wanna be able to, know that you've done something that's gonna actually help you and enable you to participate in the world, but mm. strangely, it's made you feel like you've regressed into some behind the scenes territory. Yeah, and yeah. How, to, how to get to the front is Like tricky. when the elevator opens in the Truman Show and you see like oh, yeah, the yeah, TV. Exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but it's kind of a nice time and it's always uh, finite. I think we need to like get better at uh, enjoying living in that time because it always goes away and sometimes you wish yeah. for it back. Oh, totally. Um, Totally. Yeah, I uh, I wanted to uh, I wanted to ask you something which I I don't know if there's even an answer for necessarily, but um, when I think about my work and my sort of practice and the things that I am trying to build, I'm always thinking of this um, eventual like nirvana or like paradise where my work will be occupying the space, the exact space that I want it to be, whether that's just in my brain or like out in the world. And I wondered like, I feel like I need to read how I, 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 I guess I wanted to know like what your dream is for your work, all your, you know, your work, not just right now, but always. Is there some space you one day wish to occupy or something that you're marching towards or are you there? Do you feel that you're there? Yeah. Is that a weird question? No, it's know. not. It's like, I think it's a question that I, I think more, more writers would benefit from being asked <laughs> more regularly. Not that one needs like a long con, you know? No, 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 not at all. But yeah. I think to see, a, to see your work as something that can tumble into other work mm -hmm is really helpful. Mm. Um, I definitely, one thing that I've never taken to is 
you, you can only be one kind of writer or oh, yeah. one kind of artist. And one opportunity with this book is that it's opened up to me the strangest opportunities that are completely unrelated to writing, mm. you know? Um, and my hope is that that keeps happening. I hope that whatever writing I do, it unlocks opportunities that I assumed were unavailable to me. Mm -hmm. I went, I was in Stockholm last month speaking at an architecture and design museum and I know pretty much nothing about it, but mm. the curator really wanted me there wow. to talk b based on my book. Mm. And when I got on the phone with him to talk about it, I realized why is because how he interpreted my book as this curator was all about spatial awareness and rooms and interior spaces, which is true. It's Absolutely. a huge preoccupation of mine. You're very so form oriented actually. Yes, now and I he got and he got that and I yeah. I just didn't I didn't I, it wasn't as obvious to me and I had to write this talk and go present it to an audience that was in large part, you know, architects mm. and uh, and graphic designers and people just really technical. Mm -hmm. And I was I was anxious about how how could I convince them of my my worth here, mm -hmm. and the moment I shed that and just wrote this long talk about painters and the writing process and how it all intersects, um, I realized how lucky I was in some ways to, to get this opportunity. And so I guess for me, I just hope that writing becomes this kind of tool that keeps me traveling and meeting people and working in various mediums too, mm. you know? Um, I've had friends say, oh, you know, this is how you write, maybe you should go more into scripts or whatever, and I used to feel like, oh, no, I, I can't. Mm. And now I see it more like if someone else has interpreted that from what my writing can do, then I should pause and think about it a bit mm. more. It's, in, it's, in, it's encouraged me in some ways to learn exactly when to say no to things, and in other ways it's really encouraged me to kind of like cock my head to the side and be like, okay, maybe. Mm. And that's, a, that's really exciting for me. So yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't ever see some like big totally. plan. Um, that's a beautiful dream to have for your work though, just that it... Um yeah. Is something that is always taking on new forms and kind of moving in that way. If yeah. you ever want to uh, be a production designer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I... <laughs> in one of my... <laughs> come to me. <laughs> I love... I mean, that's the other thing, too, is, like, you learn... Through writing, I've learned qualities that I've probably had most of my life but didn't know how to harness. Like, other people saying, oh, you're a really visual person, mm -hmm. or the sonic, like, dial of a room clearly affects you. Mm. Um it gives you an opportunity to read the world, but it also has given the world an opportunity to read me and see things that I might not otherwise be so available to. So mm -hmm. it's just honestly just been a great way to have conversations and meet people that I would otherwise never meet, which mm. is incredible. Thank you so much for um, coming Thank to you. see Doga talk. Thank no, you. I feel like I learned so much about you today. <laughs> Everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>